Um, our first speaker is Nicholas uh, Thompson. He's um, had the unenviable task of being one of the, the key authors in the mechanisms of obesity. It is a um, really tricky paper. It unfortunately is not ready yet, so it's in peer review. Uh, so it hasn't been published online today, but Nick's going to share with us the key points of that um, publication. Thank you. Right, thanks everybody. Thanks, John. Thanks, Andreas, for organizing everything. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and it's also just to reflect on conversations over the last sort of 12 hours or so of us being around. Um, it's been terrific to be amongst others rather than just so I'm a genetic epidemiologist and I'm going to present you evidence from my point of view from where I see it in examining the causal implications of elevated adiposity. Now, that's a very bespoke niche, that's one part of this aggregate story. And I'm going to try and open up that in my, in my presentation today. But it just in the debates and the discussions that I've had around the tables, it's been refreshing for me to reposition and to think and to follow John's prescription and to think about how to incorporate one's evidence against a, you know, an example of others as well. So, so I thank, thanks, John, for that. Thanks for providing this forum. I think this is terrific and really something important to do. So as mentioned, I've had the unenviable task of trying to bring together into 15 minutes or so the, uh, the mechanisms of obesity. And in the very title, I struggled with this, to be completely frank. Mechanisms of obesity. Is this things going into obesity? Things coming out of obesity? Is it the underpinnings of how variation happens in the adipos adipocyte? Or is it something more macro? There's a lot of stuff to pack into this. And actually, we were challenged with providing some points of agreement, some points of difference in opinion, and then to think about a synthesis and where this is going. So I'll try and bring that in together, and hopefully there'll be some, some things which spirit discussion later on. And I hope that there are some bits that you don't agree with and some things that you don't. I always have to put these things first because I routinely forget them. I'm going to show some work from a trial. The trial was put together across a multi-site team in the UK. It was called Biband Sleeve. It's to do with bariatric surgery. And this is just to acknowledge the teams that took part. Alongside that, I'm going to show some evidence from another trial, which is of caloric restriction. It's the direct trial some of you may, may well have heard of, and present you some data from one of our own birth cohorts down in the southwest of the UK called the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, which I'll shorten to ALSPAC. So if you hear me say that later on, that's what I'm talking about. And what is that? That's a bunch of volunteers, real people in a city, giving up their time and their data to enable science. OK, so this is what I'm going to try and work through. Firstly, I'm going to try and grapple the, con the, the problem of conceptualising what we mean by the mechanisms of anything, mechanisms here of an extremely complex tray. Alongside that, then, I'm going to try and show you one example where I think there is some agreement, and then one more challenging example. I'm not going to be able to cover every single nuanced mechanism in terms of adiposity and elevated risk of obesity today. I'm sorry about that, but I will focus on things that I think I can evidence. I'll then talk about the importance of integrating evidence from different sources, independent provision of data in order to enable uh, um, progress, and then I'll give some messages to take away and to facilit facilitate debate. But like any good talk, I'll start with a quiz, and I want to know what is the linking factor between these three candidates. So Arcee went with Thompson and his book on, on growth and form, very, very early research, or actually observational research, using CPG islands to guess gene numbers, and of course Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. I'm not looking for hands up. I'm not going to hold you to go into a work group. But what I will say is all of these guys are doing measurement by proxy. They're learning from available information that's in front of them. Is it the form that we observe and that we can measure? And how is that driven by underpinning biology from Wentworth Thompson? Is it the arbitrary rules that sit around the very relative proportions of the way that a human is made up? What do we learn from that? We've got the measures, the yardsticks, but what's underneath it? And likewise, is it always correct? Using CPG islands to estimate the number of genes in the human genome, it was kind of approximate, but it was an order of magnitude out. So we had a measure, but it was wrong. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that we have measurements, but it's difficult to get at underlying mechanisms by those proxies. So how can we advance things further? I don't need to dwell on this. It was already mentioned in the earlier presentation. But we know that there is a problem here. We've got the stats, which are being published routinely, eye-watering statistics. And in my world, genetic epidemiology, we've been using genotypes which are correlated with elevated adiposity obesity risk to try and ask about the causal effect of that downstream. 
But we can also ask about upstream as well. And what's happening in this world? Well, the measurement world of epidemiology is booming at the moment. We can examine things at a clinical and macro level that we can go far deeper as well. People like Carsten Sur, who are developing this idea of the molecular human, so how much can we measure on people? The Qatar Biobank, which has got a deep catalogue of proteomics and metabolomics and genetics and so on, to try and get at these things. But is that a guaranteed mechanism or insight, or is it just more granular measurement? Alongside that, we now see these catalogues of metabolomics and proteomics. And just this week, the publication of genetic associations with proteomic data in UK Biobank on tens of thousands of individuals to help us navigate that. And indeed, the affiliated AstraZeneca rare variant paper looking at the effects of new changes, relatively new human changes in terms of their genotypes and their protein profiles. So this is a challenging area. And I fall around a paradigm like this, which we try and advance in our paper, which is that they're sure that we can measure obesity, overweight, adiposity, BMI, but actually the things that we measure around that aren't necessarily, necessarily either telling me something about things that feed into it causally or things that feed out of it causally. It's difficult from a statistical point of view to, to, to work out where one is when you only have the measurements in front of you. So the challenge is then how can we navigate that? And I would argue rather than just mechanisms of, all we have in front of us are mechanisms associated with and then we have to undertake exercises to gain inference from those measurements. OK, so a couple of examples then. One I hope we agree on, one I think will be more challenging. First up, and excuse my biases, genetics. So this is a lovely review which was brought together a little while ago by Ruth and Giles, just charting where we've come from. And it's a, really, it's a radical shift from where we were in the early 2000s to now. We've had an ongoing collection of rare mutations which have substantive effects on adiposity. And then there's been this growing collection of common genetic changes, which have been found at a population scale, which in aggregate have a relatively modest but real effect on variation in adiposity in the general population. Question is, what can one do with that and what do you learn? In this moment, though, I just want to reflect on landscape, the architecture of genetic contributions. We have this idea that there is a central dogma, that genes come first, they kick on to things that are definitely causal in terms of health and intermediaries, but that is pinned to the architecture of those signals. If one is dealing with a rare monogenic, then sure, we might learn more about causal effects going forward. However, if we're thinking about polygenicity or even omnigenicity, so the entire genome in one way or another chipping into variants at the population level, then is that really a simple story of gene to outcome? Or actually, is there a whole stream of different complex downstream factors which are important to understand? And this notion of genetic landscape and architecture that we advanced as well is really important in, term, in terms of trying to interpret genetic effects, but then also think, well, do they matter for obesity? And which part of that scheme do they sit feeding in or modulating and understanding routes to effect? So at one end of the spectrum, here's the common genetic story. In my world, we present lots of plots like this. We tend to call them Manhattan plots because they look like a skyline. All it is is evidence of effect on one axis and parts of the, chrome, of the genome along the x-axis. So if you can imagine walking through the genome, is this variant related to obesity or not? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and so on. What's fascinating is this number here. This is three quarters of a million people involved in a study. These are big studies, general population findings, lots of analytical power. That's not a genome, that's one chromosome. The genome looks like this. Look at all these signals of association across the genome. They're all over the place. Now, that's not one straightforward common biological mechanism. That's many. So the question is, what can we do with that, especially in light of this number here? Very minimum, uh, sorry, a relatively small contribution to the overall variance in BMI. So yes, these are associations with adiposity, for sure. Correlations with an easy to measure metric of that in BMI. But what on earth are all these things doing? Well, you can think about them in aggregate. So here's a score which has been put together, adding up all of those signals. You can look at the distribution of that in a population. You can say which end of that distribution does an individual lie, and what does that mean? If you do that in half a million people in UK Biobank, you can see elevated risks of, of type 2 diabetes by an, a, about an odds ratio of about 1.7 or more. And indeed, if you take that out into longitudinal studies, you can see that you get elevated chances of having bariatric surgery, elevated chances of being obese in the long term, and so on. 
You can go further than this. You can look in longitudinal life course data and ask backwards what, is, what happens over the life course. And when you've got a study like this one, the birth cohort I told you about in Bristol, you can chart that. This little plot here is just the relationship between that same score and mean weight, but in individuals who are four months old. So what happens if we zap forward a few years and we go to four years old? We see a more linear relationship between the two. Let's go further then, through 12 years and all the way out to 18 years. So we now have, yes, relatively modest differences in kilograms change, but a very clear relationship between polygenic risk contributions and outcomes. Devil in the detail, these elevated risks are also, these polygenic risk profiles are correlated with other things. They're complicated. Remember that genetic map? It's not just the nailed on adiposity locus or a collection of them, but these things have many, many ways of having their effect. Okay, and worse still, we don't know what all of these things do. This little example here on chromosome 16 is FTO. FTO, we originally thought, was due to something to do with either energy intake or maybe the composition of diet. Well, actually, it turns out it may well be related to completely different genes which are next door and may well be telling us something about how the adipocyte works, the browning of adipocytes and how me metabolic rates contribute to overall adiposity. So there's complexity even behind genetics. Can rare variants help? Well, some of them are interpretable, but again, they sit in their own stories. Here's just one, MC4R. So this is the locus which is form formulates part of this appetite regulatory mechanism, which has got both in-brain associations going on, but there's also local things going on in terms of adipose tissue and the network of effects that might be influencing weight and downstream health. What does it look like in life course data? If you have rare mutations in MC4R, you have radical differences in BMI across the life course. And indeed, these outcompete those polygenic risk scores by some margin. The carriers of these mutations, something of the order of 10 to 15 kilograms per meter squared more than their peers, although they're relatively rare, one in about 300. So different flavors of genetic effect telling us something about function. The challenging example, right, the microbiome. Okay, this is an exciting one. It's a, it's a putative mechanism. What's exciting? Well, exciting for me that there's any common co-variation at all. I urge you to have a look at this paper, which was quite early, 2016 in science, but showing that you can, across studies, show common contributions to microbiome variation. Why is this exciting to a geneticist? Well, it means that actually maybe there is some commonality. It's not completely labile. And indeed, we undertook a study looking at the genetic contributions to the gut microbiome. What was alarming here was actually there's a little bit of heritability, but a lot of that is wrapped up in disease loci. And indeed, the only reliable hit that's coming from host to microbiome at the moment is MCM6, which is our old friend, lactase persistence. OK, so we're learning something about mechanism, but it's not straightforward that the microbiome is doing the job. And indeed, if you put that into an analytical framework, asking about genetic prediction, this is the other way around, of BMI and how that might have an effect on the microbiome, you see something really exciting. All of these blobs on this graph here are simply ranked according to their weight of evidence for a causal effect not of the microbiome on BMI, but of BMI on the microbiome, going the other way around. And if this is your area, you'll probably recognize some of these names, but the key thing is that you see reduced diversity, decreased, number of ab uh, decreased abundance of genera, altered familiastasis and ratios. This is a forward effect. This is the microbiome responding, not the other way around. So think again about that framework and trying to gain evidence to understand direction. Integrating evidence, right. Coming back to this paradigm then, how can we bring studies together to help? We brought together the direct study, which is an intervention looking at caloric restriction and outcomes of that in terms of remission and weight reduction, and the biband sleeve trial, which is a randomized allocation of different surgery types. What did we do in here? We tried to measure intermediate phenotypes, in this case the metabolome, to understand the downstream, downstream implications of those events where we know how the difference has been achieved, either surgery or caloric restriction. In direct, we see a whole bunch of metabolites being changed. In biband sleeve, with surgery, we see a whole bunch of metabolites being changed. So circulating small molecules telling us about cellular activity in the body. Fascinatingly, these things overlap, and considerably so. If you plot this, you can see an overall correlation, which is more than we would have expected by chance alone. And it tells me something about the commonality at a biological level across these two interventions. So they're both achieving weight change, but they're actually both in, in very markedly different ways. But they're both having a similar downstream effect. 
So how is this helping us to understand? Different interventions, similar molecular effects. Is this going to help us in terms of understanding maybe the portfolio of clinical offerings to a given patient when we can achieve the same ends, but maybe by different means? We can go further. If you add in population genetics as well, we get a bunch of, uh, of uh, metabolites which also share evidence across not only surgery, not only caloric restriction, but also uh, population-based evidence suggesting these metabolites are related to BMI. That's interesting if you want to go through the list and you're, you like metabolites. But what I think is super exciting is if you look at genotypic predictors of these, not because you're asking questions of direct causality of the gene effect, because you can recapitulate those metabolomic shifts with a genotype that looks like something else. You learn about common and unseen biology. You gain inference. When you do that, you see some interesting old friends here. Bloodomic traits, corpuscular volume. You see the management of fluids. This is a shared underpinning biology between what happens after surgery, what happens after caloric restriction, and what happens after genotypically induced differences in these metabolites. It's a bit like the old paradigm of niacin deficiency and heart nups different and independent ways of achieving the same clinical end, but learning about mechanisms and trying to understand them because you now have context. OK, so what can we take away which might open up discussions from all of this evidence? Well, I think we're undertaking these vignettes, these studies already. We're looking at genotypes and how to understand downstream effects of things that elevate BMI. We can use interventions to try and understand, given that we've anchored the cause of this shift in adiposity, to understand the downstream implications of that. And indeed, with new candidates, we're able to explore how they vary and how they may or may not be contributing to adiposity. But I think the inference is missing from those studies often. And we're getting, if you look, rather diffuse signals about common and unseen underlying biology, which may well relate to appetite, behavior, disease presence, environmental features, including nutrition, which we don't pick up directly in those studies, but we're seeing by proxy. So then, to wrap, wrap this up, are we really dealing with mechanisms of, or are we just observing mechanisms associated with? And how do we unpick that? What tools do we have in our armory to try and unpick and understand directions of effect? Indeed, there is a, a, new, a newly come, there's a commission coming together right now which is trying to bring this way of thinking into the definitions of our clinical understanding of obesity, a more fluid understanding, trying to understand or bring in, if you like, a consideration that there are multiple of things feeding in and feeding out of a clinically important state. Different types of study design can offer data frames and can offer insight into this, but require inference. I've talked a bit about genetic contributions, and yes, there is a theoretical element of primacy there. But of course, they're not simple. They're signals, and we need to interpret them and understand more. Genotypic data is great because it's by and large independent of confounders and other things. But the underlying mechanism behind that isn't often clear. Interventions, indeed, help us a lot because we can anchor, or we think we can anchor, a causal effect which we can put into a trial and follow downstream. And indeed, we are very lucky in the field of weight management in so much as in the last five to ten years, we now have a portfolio of offerings to consider in terms of mechanistic effect. But again, we still don't necessarily know the mechanism. We get a black box effect. We don't necessarily know the mechanism. And of course, on top of all of that, there will be other factors that I haven't had a chance to cover here. There's going to be our failure to understand obesity and its heterogeneity. There's the capacity of an individual's adipocytes to contain triglycerides before there is a problem. There will be variation there. The staging of obesity, the multimorbidity effect, the impact and modulation of differential dietary conditions, and so on. But at the moment, what do we have? Really, in the real world, we have interventions and genotypic inference to help anchor. And then we must build evidence around other features and nutrition in other fields which don't have enough to be able to feed into this debate. But with that, I'll stop and very happy to take any questions. Yeah, I would like to ask her because you're talking about genome, that's how we are constructed. But what, what how about the, 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 the biome in the mitochondria? We know it's an energetic disease. Why don't you look at the DNA of the mitochondria? I, I didn't see you mention it. Yeah. It's a really good point. You're absolutely right. Of course, we, in some instances, pick up 
uh, genetic variation in mitochondrial DNA. I'm afraid to say, in large, the, the biggest human genetic studies to date don't really routinely navigate mitochondrial DNA. It's a, it's a failure of evidence at the moment, but there are absolutely, undeniably, both syn syndromic contributions and more common contributions to downstream metabolic disease. You're right there. There's just not a large collection of scaled evidence at the moment. Yes, absolutely, 100%. I mean, in most of these areas, crumbs, yeah, we have work to do. Any other questions? Sorry, any other questions from the audience? So, so I have a, a question, Nick, the, yeah, sure. um, maybe a couple. Uh, <laughs> the time. Uh, in terms of the, the kind of menu of interventions that yeah, you mentioned yeah, that yeah. we have today, you and I spoke a little bit about that this morning. Do you think that it may be that there's a common, because as you say, it's a black box intervention, right? You do something and then, well, yay, the person's better. Um, do you think there's commonality there? Mm -hmm. So we, we heard yesterday about producing carbohydrate. Yep. We'll hear today about caloric restriction. Yep. We know the surgery works. Do you think there's a, com a common kind of driver combining all those options that, that essentially have a beneficial effect? So it's a really, really good point. I, I wouldn't say that there's a common driver because naturally the, the interventions are different, although some of these interventions, if you take surgery, for example, against caloric restriction, there will be some commonality in the modes of effect, even though they're introduced in radically different ways. Mm -hmm. What's a surprise to us, and what I don't have at the moment, is all of those studies at my fingertips. I want a nutrition trial that's at scale, and I want pharmaceutical interventions and the JIT1 receptors ready so I can combine them all and then have a look. What we see at the moment, which is surprising to me, is that if you look across surgical intervention, across caloric restriction and genetic variation, we saw more commonality at the level of the molecule, if you like, the underlying biological response than we would have expected. I think this is a good news story. I think this, this is not saying only one of these things is having a good on-target and a bad off-target effect. I think what we're saying here is there might be some more choice available for any given patient. And that sits naturally alongside the issue of, of equality and access, because not all of these things might be the same for all populations in terms of their, you know, whether we can deliver them at a policy level. So I think, I think we're, yeah, it's interesting. Great, thank you. Uh, Gary Taubes, Oakland, California. Um, after your talk, a simple question is, uh, well, we have one observation, which is we know we have obesity and diabetes epidemics worldwide over the past 50 years. And for about the past 150 years, the medical research community has been debating the cause of obesity, the mechanisms of obesity. So my simple question is, after your talk, can you answer the question or begin to answer the question or why can't we answer the question, what is it, why is it that some of us get fat in the same food environment and others don't? Yeah. Because that's what we're all interested in, right? Yeah, sure. No, of, of course we are. And look, I, you know, what I've tried to do here is present that where I have variation in the measures available to me, so either BMI or obesity or, or comorbidities, we can use the variation there, and I can look with the tools that I have available to try and understand why there might be variation in that. So I can see that, on average, when I use genetics, for example, genotypic variation, which is not correlated to the nutritional um, surroundings for an individual or their social demographics, the small portion of variation that I'm left to work on tells me that there's something to do with the impact of that on downstream disease. And indeed, if I look at the mechanisms of some of those loci which are generating a change in adiposity, I get some clues as to what mechanisms might be involved. The problem is they're only clues, and that opens up a whole second level of, of inference and analysis, which is, OK, so if we've got candidates like MC4R in the picture, is that just straightforward appetite? It, is it really, or is there more going on there? Is there something to do about the adipocyte? Is there something to do about the conditions within it which it sits, and so on? So I think what we're doing is you're trying to unpick a distal phenotype, which is naturally complex, which is going to have a multifactorial basis, which then has not only idiosyncrasy, but heterogeneity in any given environment behind it. What I'm showing you here is that the independent signals that we have, so if you reduce calories, you generate a weight change on average in a randomized setting. You can achieve the same end by randomly allocating surgery. You can achieve the same end by randomly allocating a, a GLP-1 receptor agonist. We know those things work. What I'm not claiming is that I perfectly understand the mechanisms of delivery of those effects.
So the answer to the question why some people get fat and others don't is still, I don't know. Is that safe to say? Well, I would go halfway. I would say <laughs> in some instances we know that those guys are going to harbor either polygenic risk, which is different to other people, or rare mutations. Now, all I'm not, the thing I won't go so far as saying, I precisely know how those things work. OK, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Hi, Nick. Thank you. Campbell, Murdoch GP, and uh, yeah. you've advanced the knowledge that you shared at breakfast. <laughs> um, question about homeostasis. So as a GP in translating information to patients, I um, always look for a simple framing that can open up. And um, if I can remember the Encyclopedia Britannica definition correctly of homeostasis, it, but it's the, uh, the tendency of biological systems to adapt to maintain stability in a changing environment. Sure. And if, uh, and if uh, homeostasis is successful, life continues. If not, disaster or death ensues. Uh -huh. uh, the human body, massive complex adaptive system, as you just highlighted. Thoughts on uh, what we're seeing is this multitude of homeostatic systems in an ever-changing hierarchy of competitiveness from parts, sort of microscopic cells trying to maintain homeostasis through to blood glucose homeostasis, and it's the least, the body adapting to the least harmful situation to ensure disaster or death does not ensue, depending on what external inputs are coming into the body. And this obviously brings in primary drivers to try and maintain body fat for mm -hmm. future survival mm -hmm. and our primitive drivers towards that. Um, is homeostasis a framework that could be useful to help unpick some yeah. of this? So I'll just make two very brief comments in light of time. Um, Number one, in my world, um, canalization is a big deal. So it's all very well me standing up and saying a rare mutation X or a common mutation Y is really important, and just to ignore the fact that there will, of course, be redundancy in the system. And there will be a natural flux to that. So again, that's part of your inference. All you've got is the measures in front of you. Now, one presumes, or one makes this assumption, it's largely incorrect, but there is persistent and stable genetic effects. But not only have you got redundancy in the system, but you've got changes through life. What happens to BMI during puberty? And what does that do to your genetic signals for something that's supposed to predict how adipocytes work? It changes, right? So we have to constantly be thinking about this longitudinal format. It's why we focus on cohort studies and try and follow people routinely. Because it's the only way of getting at this sort of homeostatic response and recover. And that will have a really important effect. Um, so I think Samount 4 has just come out into Zepatide. Only goes out to 88 weeks. Now that's super informative, very, very important. And it's an interesting comment on longevity. But we need statin length investigations of how these things are going to work in order to understand them better and to understand those relationships between tweaking something, helping somebody's weight, and or rem getting remission for diabetes and so on, and then understanding what's happening underneath that. I hope that helps. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Rob, you can get, we, we're quite late. Do okay, you want me to Really quick. No, 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 ask a question. But Just a quick question. Yeah, sure. Um, I heard you make a very common bariatric surgery mistake. Okay. That is to assign, to say, um, obesity and then comorbidities. I will tell you that diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is polar opposite to obesity. They're different diseases with the same common cause. In other words, obesity doesn't cause type 2 diabetes. I would think that if you looked at the same genetic profiles and did the same investigative testing in populations who are not necessarily obese, maybe overweight, yeah. but have type 2 diabetes, and put the, put the two over the top of each other, you may get a lot more interesting data okay. than just looking at obesity. So Has that happened? That was the last table. So it was three sources of evidence. An intervention which was randomized, randomized allocation to uh, caloric restriction, into, it randomly allocation to surgical intervention, and then population-based genetic variation. So healthy folk, if you like, and how that then overlaps. And what I was showing there is that we get agreement across those. Now, it's by no means complete, but you're right, we start to learn something fascinating about the commonality. Across, what, is, what is linking those three things? Why would you get agreement in terms of cellular response across those independent sources of variation? I think that's a goldmine, actually, for us. I think that's something, your, your, your point is, is spot on, I think. Thank you. Thanks. I better sit down. Nick, thank you very much. <laughs>